Community archaeology already has an established record worldwide, especially in the Americans and Australia. We have an ever-growing literature that offers a variety of approaches, experiences, and proposed blueprints for scholarly engagement with communities or stakeholders. Community projects are practiced in a variety of institutional settings and are characterized by different scales, motives, and resources. What becomes apparent, though, is that while the notion of engaging non-academic audience in the conduct of archaeological work may seem quite straightforward at first, um, its practice reveals a bewildering variety of contexts, methods, and outcomes. So what is necessary and what we're going, we, we usually propose is not a blueprint, a methodological blueprint, but a common agreement on the contingency of social situations and values, and also a way to place our research and action in the field, inside networks of stakeholders and interlocutors and in instituted power networks. So, one of the expressed goals of engaged archaeological projects, like the one I'm going to talk about today, and I was going to show today, but I'm not, um, is the betterment of the conditions of local communities and the leveling out of social inequalities through or concurrent to archaeological research. In a globalized capitalist system, this often passes through some sort of commodification of heritage necessarily. We don't like it, but it does. Um, not particularly commodification of the artifacts per se, not necessarily that, but also as heritage as a broadly conceived cultural property of a community or group. So heritage will be transformed one way or another into a resource for the local community aimed at circulating capital in the form of funding or tourism creating jobs, checking demographic uh, and ecological depletion. So, commodification of people, values, history is something we as heritage experts are forced to work with, work in, and more often than not react against, and needless to say, justifiably so. Existing critiques, however, of heritage management aim with a very good reason at big projects that commodify archaeological heritage without respect for local societies or take the part of strong stakeholders who already have a dominant position in power hierarchies. While this critique is valid for larger projects, it however acquires a different meaning for smaller places that are much lower in the hierarchy of archaeological heritage value. Uh, for such places, the management of archaeological uh, or historical or cultural heritage sometimes becomes a last-ditch effort at resisting resource depletion, population outflux, and ecological disaster. So sometimes, despite our reservations and critiques, it is the locals themselves who make a demand to us as heritage experts to turn their heritage into some sort of cultural capital to preserve themselves and their communities. Um, this is exactly what happened in our case, in the, um, our, the project we ran with Vangelis and uh, Lena and Celine Murphy in, uh, in the village of Ronies in central Crete. Um, it, it's an archaeological project that was turned into heritage historical heritage management project by the demands of the very people it proposed to study. So, the Three Peak Sanctuaries of Central Crete project is an archaeological project led by Vagelis. It investigates three Minoan peak sanctuaries that overlook the mountainous part of the province of Malevisi in Central Crete. Um, the project is based, we are based in the larger village in the area called Ronies some 35 kilometers down the road connecting Iraklio, the capital city of the island, to the region of Milopotamos, with a very well-known village of Anoya, most of you must have heard. Um, Gonies lies on the foot of a hill called Filiorimos that hosts one of the three peak sanctuaries uh, that the project studies. Now, the entire area was heavily grazed and cultivated in the past, um, but most of this area lays fallow now. 
Village pastures, however, are still in use by some villages who, who keep flocks uh, of sheep and goats. Now, the beginning of our project was marked by several seasons of ethnographic fieldwork, which involved initial consultation with local individuals and associations to establish the social context in which the research was to be carried out, and also understand what people expected from us from this research. Um, it soon became evident that the village saw in the archaeological interest in the area a potential for local development and invested heavily in local archaeological presence as an agent for community regeneration. Now, why would that be so? Um, when we first arrived in the village in 2007, well, when Vagelis first went to the village in 2007, it was inhabited by no more than 200 people. It was a village of uh, around, today there must be around 160 people alive in the village. Most of the people living in, the, in Ronies at the time were poor and elderly in their majority. Um, the village lacked and still does outlets for basic produce such as bread, which is brought in from nearby villages. Medical provision is very sparse. Um, also, the village school was finally closed in the early 2000s for lack of pupils. Um, okay, this might sound like a you know, typical picture for any, I don't know, uh, remote village in, in, Greek, in Greece, but what's uh, remarkable about Gonyes is that it was a very strong, very densely populated village up to the late 60s. And within a decade, uh, the population, uh, due to out-migration, uh, the fall, the precipitous drop in the prices of agricultural produce and um, resulting out-migration, fell from, the population fell from 1,000 people to 200, so within a decade. So you can imagine there are people who lived through it and remember their village being turned from a very strong, very powerful, very um, lively village into the village that it is today. Um, and this is, this is precisely what we hear when we begin our project in the village. You should do this because we want people to come back. We want people to uh, have, have jobs here. We want our village to regenerate, to start living again. Um, all right. Now, Existing critiques of heritage focus on its exclusionary nature. So heritage development, when we try to develop heritage programs, it is claimed we offer a watered down and one-sided version of a place's history, of a people's history, um, which is usually based on the concerns and chronologies of official national archaeology, which Laura Jane Smith refers to as the Authorized Heritage Discourse, AHD. And um, this, this uh, one-sided version of history offered, usually offered in heritage uh, management projects prevents the participation of local communities and less powerful groups in the selection and creation of historical sites and historical narratives. Again, much of this critique is justified and correct. And the role of archaeologists especially in defining and shaping policies discourses and power structures that sustain this version of heritage is certainly instrumental. Um, however, most field archaeologists like us and heritage specialists today are forced to work within the already existing confines of the current state in heritage management and production. Um, this is not only an institutional imposition but is also often a demand on the part of the communities themselves. So often it is the communities that in theory would be marginalized by the um, authorized heritage discourse that more forcefully and more persistently demand from the archaeologists a plagiarized version of the official heritage discourse. In Greek cases that I know of, in my experience, it is often the archaeologists and not the local community that actively insert multiple temporal scales, that highlight unnoticed modern sites and marginalized narratives in local notions of heritage. Uh, that is contrary to what Laura Jane Smith would argue, of course. 
So in, in our example, in the past few years, um, the neighboring municipalities of Crusonas and Anoya, two villages that are very near Ronyes, um, they have exploited the prehistoric finds in their areas to produce what they call the Minoan path to the mountain of Ida, Psiloritis. Um, so they have uh, actually built uh, stone paved paths that lead potential visitors to the area, to Psiloritis. Um, and uh, with the aim, explicit aim, to connect, first of all, in this path, the two major archaeological excavations in the area, one in Crusonas, Kupos, and the other in Anoya, well-known Zomithos, and finally to Ideonandron. Now, it's surprising, not surprisingly, uh, this path uh, does not go through Gonyes. It completely bypasses the village. Um, so the people of Gonyes actively joined in the, in the dispute um, that, has a, that, that is a dispute over the, the accuracy of the Minoan path by proposing their own Minoan path that goes through Gonyes, of course. Um, and we are very, um, we have been persistently called by the people of Gonyes to justify with our presence and our research the, the fact that, yes, indeed, the Minoan path passed through Gonyes and Gonyes only. So it's their path. Um, but the way we, we approach this uh, question is not so much as an, uh, a disputable truth claim, but as an ideological struggle over the use of the past that reflects very real struggles over resources, the use of resources. So this struggle to us is essentially about the, the use of heritage as a resource in the area, and it's a very political question. Um, to approach this question and critically for us, because we are with the village of Gonia, so we should support the local community, would, would help in this case, essentialize claims to authenticity that in the Greek state are part of the ideological construction of national identity and therefore exclude differences rather than include them. So as heritage experts, our role is not that clear most of the time because we find ourselves trapped between our critical distance from authorized heritage discourses and the demands of the local society we work in. How much time have I got? 40 minutes. That's a lot. <laughs> now, I have been using a very much um, problematized term, a very um, difficult term, that of the expert to um, describe our role in a local society. Um, again, critiques of the role of experts in local settings are very pertinent and very justified because in the grand scheme of things, archaeologists are usually middle or upper class individuals. They are affiliated with affluent institutions. They are more proximal to power sources in the developed capitalist world. Their institutional position, instead of opening the way for local participation, occludes this participation in the discovery and study of archaeological artifacts. Locals are rarely mentioned even in archaeological publications, although their contributions are usually um, very important. Um, However, again, to a certain degree, the power differentials between archaeologists, field archaeologists, and local communities are usually overstated. Um, in the Greek case in particular, it is often not sufficiently highlighted how most field archaeologists and heritage experts are usually restrained by institutional structures, legal boundaries, bureaucratic controls, and lack of funds and time. Similarly, it's not sufficiently exposed how much experts find themselves deeply embedded in local or supra-local power networks that they also are not capable of manipulating, uh, but inf they influence, however, severely the income, the outcome of their studies. Um, so, in this respect, engaging locals 
in the production and dissemination of archaeological or historical heritage is not something that is up to the archaeologist entirely. It's not something we decide to do and it happens. It doesn't happen that way. It's not that straightforward. Um, our expert knowledge does not guarantee the position of the experts in the village in every respect. Um, we have to also navigate, for example, the hierarchies, what I call hierarchies of indifference um, that appears and relates to our work. So people choose what they uh, find interesting and maybe profitable and what not. Um, so not all our work, not all archaeological um, knowledge is of value to locals. And not all of it has to be imparted in order to create, um, to rather engage more fully locals with existing hierarchies of value. Um, we sometimes also end up in situations where we are not aware of the local, do, do we need to evacuate? <laughs> We're not uh, aware of the network, the local and super local networks of power we find ourselves in. So unless we have been doing ethnographic work for quite some time, and we are in fact part of the community in a way, accepted in the community, we do not understand what we are getting ourselves into uh, and what use uh, people make of our expertise for their own purposes. Uh, locally. So community archaeology, what I wanted to say, maybe this summarizes the, the whole thing, is that it's not a nostalgic and conflict-free reiteration of the past. We're not doing that. It is an action, an activity that brings to the fore uh, conflicts within established ideological supports of indigeneity and belonging. It does not only engage with abstract notions of the past, what, what people remember, but with very real power inequalities in the present. Uh, even the simple action of uh, putting out a heritage map in a village, like we did two years ago, will often cause uh, repercussions that we're not aware of. For example, in this map, we included um, traditionally traditional female spaces like the village spring in what we considered um, heritage of the village, causing the reaction of men who thought that the heritage of the village should only be uh, connected to heroic feats and uh, brigands and uh, the revolution, uh, the uprising against the Turks, etc., etc. Um, so we're always already caught up in, in local and super local and national and international conflicts anyway. So what is, we need, I think, and to summarize and conclude, is another, a different sort of engagement with local communities that first of all establishes that knowledge is managed, thank you, in a collective way, that there are contributions from both locals and experts, and that is commonly understood how such knowledge serves the purposes of different stakeholders, both local, uh, regional, uh, scientific, or otherwise. The second point is that this engagement should position the research and the researcher in, the way, in a way that it lays open its motives and its effects to the community. And finally, a research that will build relationships that enable archaeological expertise to be of impact and use to the local community. Simultaneously, this, uh, this action will allow archaeologists to effectively act as mediators, referees, or simply active participants in the effort to buttress economic and social deterioration and build heritage projects that are relevant and useful. And I will conclude at this point. I'm not tired anymore. Thank you.